You're listening to Brand Enabled, the human stories behind branding. This is the place to gain greater insight into the human side of branding. Join Gabriel Cohen as he sits down with branding experts, sharing real life stories of how they faced complex issues along their journey. Learn how others are dealing with maximizing the power of brand and get valuable advice straight from your peers. Here's your host, Gabriel Cohen. So welcome to another episode. Today, I'm here with Gabriela Heno, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of Alpha Sites. And we're going to be talking today uh, to someone who's gone through an increasingly uh, common situation, which is a sort of transition from the consulting side, uh, from the advisory side to to the client side, uh, a journey that we see more and more people in, in embarking on and get under the hood now. So, uh, Gabriella, thanks for joining us and welcome. Thank you. Really happy to be here. And and where are you joining us from today? I'm actually in Paris today. That is wonderful. And for the people that are listening, I probably wish that they were they were they were there as well. So maybe let, let's let, let's jump straight in. Talk to us. Let, let's just start with the fact that you're at Alpha Sites today. Uh, probably a lot of people haven't heard of Alpha Sites. Tell us a bit about tell us a bit about the company, uh, the industry, who you serve. Yeah, absolutely. So Alpha Sites um, is a uh, medium-sized business, about two thousand employees. We uh, started in 2008 by two co-founders who still run the business today. And um, the best way to describe us is a knowledge on demand platform. And essentially what we do is we provide um, professional investors with access to individuals who are experts in an industry, geography, or company. And they then speak to those experts and... um, in order to gather information, get smarter, and um, and so it's kind of we're we're basically in in a subdomain of primary research, and one of the really interesting things about the way Alpha Sites has approached the industry um, is that uh, uh, about six years ago, Alpha Sites started to really heavily invest in technology. So they took what was originally created as a sort of professional services industry and have transformed into a tech-enabled company um, over, over the last six years. And, and so that, that's that been just an incredible journey and um, uh, fascinating to, to watch and be a part of. So if I'm, if I'm in management consultancy or, am I, or if I'm a uh, private equity and I'm looking to make an investment or I'm, or I'm serving a specific client and I need that quick hit expert insight then alpha sites helps 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 pair me with someone who could then really speed up or accelerate my knowledge on a specific topic is that roughly the proposition yep. that that's exactly right yeah it it helps accelerate your knowledge help to deepen your knowledge uh, because in in our clients industries and in, in consulting um, for people who work in funds hedge funds private equity funds it, they're always trying to find to to move faster than the competition a lot a lot of funds are chasing the same deals and then they're also always trying to find a unique angle so it's about this it, it's about the the speed of access to information but it's also about the depth of information and just becoming an expert really quickly so that you can um, find the the best angle um, over your competitors. So it's really cool because you're we're actually in the business of helping to really utilize the the um the tacit knowledge that is stuck in people's brains all over the world and to kind of democratize the the, the sharing of it um in, in well not a, fully democratized because you only want a few people to have it because otherwise I don't get the edge. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. But we want to make sure that anybody who who wants to access it can and and actually we um we 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 often do find that a, a lot of our you know what what's really interesting is you start to see sort of what's the level of rigor and diligence that different companies put into their knowledge discovery work so 
um, will be able to observe those those kind of um, research patterns and how they change, right? And how you know one consultancy may uh, talk to three experts, right? Tiny end size. Another consultancy who from the outside looks like they're probably working on the same deal because they want to speak to people with really similar profiles. Maybe they'll have you know, an end size which is like five times, right? So you it, it's you also start to notice really interesting things like that about how. Uh, the patterns of how different companies work, different people work, um, how knowledge flows go. In other words, in which part of the world do the experts sit and in which part of the world do the knowledge seekers sit, right? So it's it's very it's very cool that way from a sort of macro trend observation perspective. And, and I bet if you could even listen into conversations with the same expert, you'd even probably get to see a difference in how they ask the questions, the type of questions they ask as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you would. Now, now we obviously can't listen into their conversations, but their compliance officers can. And yes, I think you you would definitely see, you know, a difference. And 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 you know this as an interviewer, right? You need to know how to ask the right questions in order to get good information. So um yeah, I'm I, and the quality of the of the interviewers probably does vary from one client to another. It's interesting because a, a friend of mine is a CFO of a healthcare uh, company, and it's something that he has done in an increasing amount over the last two years. It feels like every week he's like, oh yeah, I'm, I had to do this paid interview where I acted as a subject matter expert for something or something or other. It feels like it's a, it, not only is it a so a it feels like a growing trend, but b you mentioned that technology is a big differentiator. Mm. Um, yeah. in this. Like, how does that how does that actually help? Then, as opposed to well, look, we've got a really good uh, group of you know we've got a huge network of connections. So, whatever question you have, we can go and find the right expert. But how does technology become a differentiator? How do you distinguish yourself in the space? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So different players in the space use technology in different ways. A lot of our competitors use technology to essentially um, identify experts and create a massive database of, of experts who they can tap into. Having said that, because the experts are identified often using AI and, and, and sort of crawlers and things like that, they're not necessarily pre-vetted, right? So it's it's kind of the equivalent of you or me going into LinkedIn and, and, and typing, and we have access to lots of names, but the filtering is is maybe it hasn't been done by by a human, but that's a use of technology, which is incredibly powerful in, in this industry. The way AlphaSites is using technology is that we actually have um, a smart human vet every single expert hand, and we only recruit experts for people's projects. So the quality of the experts that we recruit is is higher because they're each hand picked for existing client briefs, existing client projects. But we then use technology to codify or structure a lot of data about the that expert's uh, knowledge areas on the back end. So we then store that, and then it's much easier for the client to then access that structured data or their colleagues or future individuals who want to refer that expert. So essentially we're able to act as kind of like the the um the brain of of a large organization. So if you if you think about like a, a huge management consultancy, right? They're doing globally, you know, thousands and thousands of these calls a year. And if and and for for them to keep track of all of that knowledge and not let it go to waste, it's incredibly hard because they have, you know, these calls happening in different geographies, different languages, different employees. Maybe those employees are storing them in their hard drive and leaving, you know, all of this. Whereas we can then store all that information and we can structure it so that then if individuals from that consultancy want to say, oh, let me go through the transcripts of those calls and see what I can find about XYZ company through keyword searches. All that information can get structured and they can refer back to it. It's it's their information, right? They they paid for the access to that expert and they should have uh, be able to refer back to it. So that's that's an example of one of the ways that Alpha Sites is is doing it things differently, and I think in a very innovative way. It's really all about structured data. It's it's interesting then because when you when when you having we're going to get to this in a second but having been in consultancy 
for 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 so long one of the questions you often ask is you know what business are we in or what business are you in and oftentimes you know it, consultants get hired when you are when the client says well if you ask 10 different if you ask 10 people you'll get 10 different answers mm-hmm. so, and and i've heard from you say well you, you could say that you're in the knowledge management business so you're, you're in the structured data business how, how do you describe then what business you're in especially like there are so many parallels to what you're saying that almost sound very similar to what a modern uh a talent or recruitment agency has in terms of some of the core skill sets yeah i mean the I, I thought a lot about that because one of the first things I did when I joined Alpha Sites in, in 2020 was to to do a sort of brand repositioning, both from um and a visual identity refresh. And the reason for that was because we were ready to go to market with this much more tech-enabled solution. And we need to figure out how to how to signal the change. And so actually what what we landed on as um you know, all, all the individuals who worked on the project together uh, was was to describe ourselves as a knowledge on demand platform, because that really describes, I think, the, the, the benefit to the end consumer or the end user, right? It's accessing um, the knowledge of experts on demand through a digital platform. Now, all the other things that we've talked about, right, structured data, et cetera, those are those are the enablers, right? Those are those are the means to the end, um, the bits of IP that we've created, which enable us to to provide to be to provide on demand access to to this tacit knowledge. Okay, so that's a great segue then into the fact that you came into this into this mm-hmm. role a, a couple of years ago. Let's go back a couple of steps and and talk about then. To tell us about your journey in 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 consulting and advisory, and what sort of led to that moment where you're like, I know, like I'm 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 ready to I'm ready to make the jump, ready to leap. Yeah, well, I started actually in in advertising. I worked very briefly at AMV BBDO, which is a great London based ad agency, and then I moved to the uh, brand uh, uh, consultancy arm of of BBDO, and spent um, about two years there, and. Um, kind of uh, learned consulting, learned business. I had studied political sciences at university. So so I, ha- I had a lot of basics about business to, to learn. And then once I had sort of uh, gotten those under my belt, then then I went to profit, uh, profit brand strategy, where I spent 14 years. And, and I really, really sort of grew up there professionally, absolutely loved it. Um, I joined when it was 100 people. Uh, Michael Dunn, the CEO, interviewed me. He was interviewing everyone at the time. You know, I traveled a lot, formed really strong bonds with my colleagues, with my clients, um, tons of variety in the work, just, you know, had the most amazing time. And and um, and after 14 years of that, though, I thought, okay, well, I, I kind of want to become a little bit more well-rounded as a marketer, right? I've been doing a ton of strategy. Yeah, design strategy, digital strategy, brand strategy, or, you know, org strategy, but so much strategy work. I, I kind of want to see what it's like to be an operational marketer. Um, and um, and so that's when I, I started to to look around. And and I found Alpha Sites, uh, which is a great business. It's a business that I knew a little bit about. I had used the... You know the the service before as a consultant, um, founder led business, still um, you know at, at a good size. I think it was about um, just around a thousand people when I joined, maybe nine hundred. So not not too big, not a sort of Fortune five hundred type atmosphere. And and I just sort of took the leap. I thought you know what you know they they they're willing to take a chance on me, and and um, and I understand the business and I'm passionate about it, and and I know they need to do a brand repositioning. So at least I'm I'm sure I can help with that bit, and and the rest you know we'll see. So to your other part of the question, was I was I ready? No, probably not ready. But I think you know one never is ready for 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 these changes. You just have to go in, and 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 I. I had the confidence to know that at least one of the things in my mandate I was going to be able to do really well. So so I think that's probably what gave me the yeah the the courage to say okay let let's try. Yeah that's so that's a really interesting insight because embedded in that story were a few of those criteria like you said that okay if you're going to do it to set yourself up for success it sounds like the, the biggest thing was great the the initial ask 
there's clarity around it's not like you went in so it's not, it's not like you went in to to look at the first 60 90 days and then decide that a brand positioning needed to be done like that was already sort of agreed and aligned on at a at a senior level in inside the organization because because we all know that um sometimes that alignment inside a, a company takes so, so sometimes it takes three years from you know the cmo or the brand lead knowing that a reposition needs to be done and it actually starting because it, it brand is one of those things that that that, that, that needs so much alignment yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and I think they, um, because they knew they wanted to do a brand, you know, repositioning, that's why my profile was was attractive over some a marketer with, you know, very complete experience, but perhaps less brand focused than than I had been in the past. Um and and you're absolutely right. I think it's very helpful to walk into a mandate knowing at least one of the jobs to be done. Because when you're new to an organization, it takes a little while to to figure out, you know, what what should be on on that roadmap. What are, everybody's going to give you a different list of priorities. Everybody's going to tell you that a different thing is broken, right? And and sorting through all that information, and really understanding the business well enough to prioritize properly, that can take a little time. And I remember when I was at Profit, um, one of the things we'd help a lot of CMOs with was their their sort of first 90 or 100 day plan. Um, and it's really hard to create one because you need to learn the industry and the organization so fast and you have to figure out how to prioritize. And that's no small feat. So I think I was very fortunate to have at least, you know, one big project earmarked for me so I could go in, sink my teeth in, um, you know, get a win on the scoreboard early. So compare and contrast then the the experience of having gone through dozens of brand repositioning, brand re brand evolution exercises on the consulting side, and then having gone through your first one then client side. Hmm. Yeah, it was it was it was really interesting. So the first insight was that you know we when I was client side there wasn't the nearly as much appetite or patience to do things, um, to do the strategy part as rigorously as um, we usually would have done it at profit for our big Fortune 500 clients, right? So so trying to find that happy medium between, you know, knowing that it was really important to apply a certain amount of rigor, knowing it was important to test and learn, um, but not going overboard and also uh, not giving up and, and doing none of it at all. Trying to find that happy medium was was a little bit challenging, I'd say. But that was probably the first thing that that surprised me. Uh, you know, when you walk in there and and you and you say, what, you, you, you mean you don't want us to do focus groups, then quant research, and then focus groups again? And they're like, no, 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 that sounds like it's going to take nine months. We definitely don't want to do that, right? That was, that was probably the first surprise, the first thing that was different. And then it was also, I must say, I loved working with the in-house design team to create the visual identity and, and giving them the chance to create it and then implement it. That I, I absolutely love doing. And I think it was so much more rewarding for them. And I think the the implementation of the visual identity went much more sl- smoothly as a result. And, and that was that was also very different because obviously when I'd been on the advisory side, we have you know brilliant teams of graphic designers coming up with something you know spectacular. And then the design team at the client side sort of starts to groan when they when they think about how to implement it and, and the, all the impracticalities and you know, oh, you've just put an ombre color into my color palette. How am I going to put that into my email signature? And you know, so whereas I it was it was really great to to have the same team that working on the visual identity and the implementation. And that is something which um, I think it was also like far more time and cost efficient, to be honest with you. And, and that was a big learning for me that I would definitely try to take on uh, for the future. It, it sounds like some of the learnings and that or some of the differences were, were were less about the fact that you were working client side versus internally. And part of it was because maybe a, a medium sized company like Alpha Sites wouldn't really have had the budget to work with a profit where you applied this but it, it's also it it indicates a little bit from an uh, from from an advisory side that you need to flex the process and the approach depending on depending on the client I feel like 10 years ago it was very sort of very much a one note approach to how you did 
a brand evolution project, like you said, okay, it's going to be these steps. It's always the same steps. And it's going to yeah. take six, it's going to take six to nine months, but now it feels like you need to be thinking about these types of brand projects in a more heterogeneous way, as opposed to it just being very homogenous. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think, um, I think all, anyone working in, in marketing now needs to keep questioning, has to constantly ask themselves, you know, what's the right process? Just because I followed that process before, it doesn't mean it's the right one for this organization at this moment in time. And, and, and I would kind of challenge what you just said. I think you're right. Historically, a lot of the large companies have, have been really up for these lengthy, rigorous processes. And, and that's what I experienced as well. But I think that times are changing. And I think that also a lot of these very large companies are are saying, you know, no, we're going to, we're going to take a more agile approach. We're going to be a little braver. We're going to do things differently. And, and it's really important to, I think, as you said, be super adaptable and, and, um, and, try it different ways. Um, the other thing which I, I re remember from, from my advisory days is that people often hire consultants because, or, or agencies, because they want, you know, really good creative ideas or really good structured strategy or fantastic uh, or, or incredible rigor, right? Really deep analysis, right? Those are, those are some very common reasons. And once you're client side, I think you know the um, you know what's going to drive the smooth decision making process, you know quite well. That that's your job to understand that, and so it then helps you better decide. Okay, do I actually need an agency or not, or am I, or or you know what, I actually just need creativity but I don't need rigor and I don't need anyone to help me with stakeholder management. So maybe I'm, I'm fine with just some freelancers who are going to inject some additional creative firepower into my process. So that was, a, that was another big learning for me once I went client side to sort of take that structure, which I, I was aware of and I was familiar with and realize how actually depending on what you need, an agency can be the perfect solution but but sometimes it's overkill, and actually there are other ways to to get um, you know that that rigor or the strategy or the creativity into the process. I, I think not to overdo overdo the point here, but I think the the other thing that you that even your role demonstrates is there's a lot more brand expertise inside organizations inside client side compared to ten years ago. Like I said, it's been this big trend of a lot of people who who have done the brand work at an agency inside the client. So when you have that much high level of, of expertise material, like I said, sometimes then you can, you, you almost play that consultant role internally, that stakeholder management you mentioned, yeah. um, or, or you need a, you need an agency that's going to work in a much more collaborative way as opposed to coming in and presenting at you, but instead you're working, you're working together. You're actually getting involved in the meat of the process, get involved in the workshops, in the co-creation, because you're going to have to, you're going to have to live with it. And I think that's an aspect that's important for agencies to adapt to the maturity level and the expertise that exists within the client organization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. Okay. So um beyond the beyond the beyond the brand repositioning, just more 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 generally, because you come in as a CMO, not just to come and do brand, what what are the skills that you felt that you've been able to that, that you've been able to bring to the role that you've seen now in the time that you've been there that have made mm -hmm. a difference that you feel that you acquired from consulting? Yeah, in in consulting, I think you definitely learn how to um, structure and and break down problems, and that was a very valuable um, skill. Um, you learn how to project and process manage, also hugely valuable. Um, you know, stakeholder management, even uh, even on the people management side, I think a, a you know a lot a lot of my um, leadership style, the way I provide feedback, the um, the type of feedback I provide, the the sort of standards that I set, all of that was very much defined in 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 my years um, as a consultant. So so I think really the 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 skills that I acquired are actually very very broad. They're not just marketing skills, I'd say. Um, they they I probably would have, um, you know, if I, if I'd left profit and, and, and taken a role in the, um, 
I don't know, um, learning and development team at a, at a large corporate, I probably would have utilized the exact same skills um, as, as the ones that I, that I took and then um, translated into my uh, role as CMO. And let's look at the other side of that. And so what, what surprised you? What, what weren't you prepared for? Yeah, so I think the the thing that I absolutely was not prepared for, and I I feel so naive saying this out loud now, is that when when you're um, on the advisory side, you know when you're going to have a conversation with a client, right? You you have it in the diary. There's anticipation. There's build up. You're physically leaving your building or you're getting on a Zoom call, right? And and so you you prep for it, right? And you prep your team for it. Um, and I, I hadn't fully understood that once you're in house, every conversation with any colleague is a client conversation and, and not just the conversations you're having, but the conversations that you're, the people in your team are having too. So every Slack, every email, every coffee chat, every formal meeting, they're all mini client interactions. And I had not really thought that part through. I had not totally understood that uh, before before actually making the move, and and then you and then you know you start to hear after a couple of weeks or uh, or months, you know, feedback through the channels of oh, so, you know, so and so in your team needs to learn more about X Y Z topic, and and you get little you know slivers of you know constructive feedback, and and you think well that's odd, you know how how where did this come from and, and you start to investigate and 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 so um yeah that that was probably the 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 most abrupt change for me that's fascinating because so you're saying that every every essentially informal conversation that you're not formally recording or thinking about as formal is either advancing the ball forward or it's or, or it's neutral or, or or potentially going backwards or or, or it's yep. creating some other you know, something else that you weren't even thinking about is coming and it's not just yours but it's 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 every it's everyone on everyone on the team so how do yep. you then balance out the that especially because you, you've got other people on the team having these conversations balance out the empowerment of the team with being able to maintain some aspect of 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 control around the narrative or the message or ensuring that you got people on the team who are prepared to be able to engage with those with those stakeholders and you're not then afterwards then having to manage a fire because they explain something in a different way or like you said the constructive feedback that comes through the grapevine yeah it's uh it's really tough i don't i don't think i have it down to a science yet but um certainly i think just explaining that to the people on the team, making them, oh, giving them that insight so that they understand um, what, what's at stake and they, and they understand why they have to sort of really show up, you know, suited and booted every day, ready to give, you know, a hundred percent. They understand the stakes essentially. So I think that that's the first thing that I've learned that setting that expectation is, is already immensely helpful. Um, and then the other thing um, that I try to do is, you know, basically not put not put people in a situation where they're leading any kind of formal meeting until they're about two years into the role. So they really have time to to practice and to build their confidence and to watch other people present. So they're not sort of officially responsible for for a meeting. Now, in between then, of course, they'll be having coffee chats with people and they'll be responding to people's emails and slacks and having all sorts of interactions but but essentially trying to layer on those responsibilities little by little and and definitely not throwing them in at the, at the deep end on on day 1 so those are those are some of the things and then of course you know we we do presentation training and and things like that for for team members but um yeah it's it's i think the probably of those three things i think just giving them that awareness, explaining the importance of it is, is in my experience, the thing that's worked the best. Have you, uh, uh, how have you seen that intentionality that you've put in payoff? So if you compare now, I don't know, 18 months on from where, where, where things were, what are you seeing that's different to, to before? Well, well, I see that the reputation of certain individuals in the team has um has really skyrocketed, right? All all they're they're perceived um 
better and therefore the the whole team is is perceived better i've also observed that they prepare differently for meetings they'll prepare a lot more they'll sync with colleagues more they'll make sure that they really understand a topic so that um in in at any given because they're they're more aware that at any given moment in time someone could come to them with a question and that actually they will look better and the entire team will look better if they can answer it as opposed to having to say, oh, you know what? That's not really me. Now let me go ask my colleague and get back to you, right? So it's it's spurred a lot more collaboration in the team, communication in the team and, and a willingness, uh, I, yeah, I guess more intentionality and, and desire, passion to be able to under, under, understand a broader array of topics and answer questions about a broader array of topics versus before I really doubled down on this, people were kind of more siloed, right? They were like, no, no, I do demand generation. So I'm only going to be able to answer demand generation questions. I, I, I'm not really equipped to answer questions about the visual identity or, you know, as an example. So when you came in, your first task was to do something that you had a lot of experience with doing, right? The, the repositioning. After that was finished, what what happened What happened next? Like, how how did you start to think about after that initial piece how you were going to manage your perception after the initial honeymoon was over, the excitement of bringing in a someone who was on a consultant side to do the brand repositioning where they were in their element. So, mm -hmm. Tell us about the next part of that journey. Well, I'd say it was it was a little bit more chaotic than that okay. because I I came in first of all in January of 2020, and by March everyone was in full lockdown. So you know, full lockdown, two kids at home, the homeschooling, you know, all all of that chaos. And my my CMO remit is, covers in, internal comms, external comms, uh, demand generation, and uh, design and digital. So it's actually a bit broader. And so the brand positioning was, you know, in 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 the, in that structure, it would have fallen into external comms. But but I was still having to run demand generation, internal comms. Um, and and a whole bunch of other things. So so unfortunately, it wasn't as linear as um, as I, I perhaps would have liked because there was just so much to get done so quickly. Um, so, for example, in parallel to doing the brand repositioning, um, I was trying to implement a lot more sort of structure and. Um, a lot more measurement in our in our demand generation sort of email marketing processes, um, and and effectively what happened is that was running in parallel to the brand repositioning, so kind of being pulled in different directions. As soon as the brand repositioning was was done, then it was okay. Now we update the website. Okay, now we update our EVP. Okay, now we redo all of our talent marketing collaterals. You know, so you you had kind of like a that was one giant work stream, and as soon as one thing was done, there was another project on the horizon, sort of that 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 was ticking along. But then you had you know uh, three other work streams going on um, in in different part areas of marketing. So. Um, it it was uh it was it was a little bit chaotic and and I, at least it felt a little bit chaotic in that first year, particularly with I think COVID it made it a little harder. As I reflect on your answer, I think the premise of my question was ultimately flawed, because I I think I was asking the question through this lens of well that's how an advisor or consultant firm finish thinks about it, which is ideally you're going to go through this process. I don't know if that experience of yours of where you had all these other demands that were happening parallel was is unique to Alpha or a big company or had anything to do with COVID. I think that's the reality client side is that is that it's not like everything stops when 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 the brand, you know, it doesn't matter how big how big the brand work is, all the other things still need to be um going yeah. on there. And there and increasingly there are more and more responsibilities, like you said, especially when you have internal comps. I think the days even of the of of that ideal brand process have sort of have, have sort of gone you have to be married it's like oh we're working on how many times do, do i hear oh okay we're, we're going to start the whole brand process now but we're going to launch the website in three months yeah and i i think you're absolutely right and and i i sus I, I suspect that it's like that for um you know in in every other business and for other every other cmo and and as you said you know before i went client side i just didn't necessarily realize that right i did and and um 
And then once you're, once you walk in somebody else's shoes for a little while, do somebody else's job, then, then uh, you, you know, you, you have a little bit more appreciation for, okay, they're these, in, you know, the, these people in, in, uh, on the client side are juggling so many different balls. Right. And, and, and that's another great reason, right. Why, why people hire um, consultancies and agencies. It's, it's to give you know them that fantastic leverage so that they can keep so many projects afloat at the same time. How how do you sort of reflect on now being at a medium sized company? How di- how the role of brand is different at a, a medium company versus a large company where you know a larger organization they can have a more a dedicated brand team that's at least focused on brand all the time but in a in a, in a smaller more nimble team where you've got lots of different priorities you can't to put like be, be focused on the big brand strategy piece the whole time yeah it's a really interesting question and i um i don't know that i would that i think about it exactly through the same lens as as what you phrase because what i would i what I hear you getting at is like a a resource constraint, right? And and that a resource constraint may stop individuals or teams from focusing on brand more. What what I experience uh, at Alpha Sites is that actually, you know, we 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 set the brand strategy, we defined it, we set the visual identity, right? We ran with. Uh, both of those for about a year. Then we made some tweaks to the visual identity. And then we decided to just keep everything stable. Why? Because it was time to just implement and keep things constant and not not confuse our, our audiences, right? And, and we needed to just repeat those messages over and over and over again. And, and the plan is quite literally to to keep everything constant for about for probably the next three years. Um, not because of lack of resources, but simply because we've we we now know what we want to stand for to our different audiences, and we now just need to get them to really internalize those messages. And so repetition is key. Um, and and that's also because you know Alpha Sites is a yes medium size, but also you know be sort of our kind you know tech enabled. Are, are we're kind of like B2B because our clients are, you know, in management consulting and in hedge funds. And so we're not really, we don't need to be running big brand campaigns, big ad campaigns, right? That That's not relevant for our audiences. So there's no real business need to change the creative strategy every every season or, or every year. Um, um, and so, so I think for that reason, you know, brand in for for this business really only has to get you know studied analyzed to make sure it's relevant to make sure it's getting cut through and 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 that's representing the business every couple of years right but but not not in the same way that you know a, a big b2c um brand would would be doing so yeah that that's sort of how how i how i think about it and and um and just getting our message across whether it's the you know our what we stand for as a company, what we stand for as an employer, or even at the value prop level of a particular service, right? What we're trying to do is is just get a flywheel going, right? Because we want people, you know, to 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 come to our platform, to do a bunch of things on the platform, and that's where they're going to get upsell, cross sell. That's where they're going to experience a whole bunch of other services, right? So so that that's the point of our marketing strategy, right? To just get these uh to get a lot of um people in into our digital environment um and and that's what we're that's what we need to be focusing on and and we don't actually need we just need to be super clear and and repeat over and over and over again in order to to make that happen when you go back and meet some of your colleagues and friends from the advisory world now that you're now that you're client side are there any sort of observations that you make for them uh around things that you, when you reflect back in when you in the consulting world that actually a, a different to the reality that you, when you're now client side like any sort of any any myths that you sort of would would dispel that are typical on the agency side yeah i i think that um as per what we discussed earlier i think maybe my my ex colleagues my friends who are still on the advisory side don't always appreciate how how busy 
people are on, on the client side, how they're being pulled in many different directions. So I, I definitely tell them about that. Um, and, and then also just how the, how, how much work can often be required to get, um, you know, to manage the stakeholders in, in, on the client side, right. To, to get that alignment, um, and how important it is for under, for them to understand those power dynamics, right. And, and, um, for them to help whoever hired them, um, to, to, not take on the feedback of the stakeholders who matter and to have, you know, updates and quick wins and things to share internally so they can show momentum. Right. So I, I definitely share that back with my, um, with my ex colleagues. Cause when you're on the outside, I'm, I'm not sure everyone can, can necessarily in, in, intuitively see all that. Well, yeah, but there's a tendency sometimes to talk about client issues in a pretty simplistic way, yeah. right? And to say, oh God, let me tell you about this client. Oh, they really struggle to make a decision. Or they don't talk to each other. Or mm-hmm. oh, you know, they, they just can't get any they, they can't get anything, anything, anything through. Yeah, exactly. And I think I, I think the, the question to ask is in, instead of saying those things, it's more like, okay, well, why are they struggling to get things through? Let me let me think about that. Let me try to help my client navigate that. Right. That I, I think a good advisor should should be doing those things, and um, it's not just about coming up with a great um, idea or a great marketing strategy. It's about helping your client to to actually make it happen, right? To to get it approved and to get it implemented. And, and often the implementation, you know, once your client side is you're implementing through individuals who are not on your team, who don't report into you, right? You need to get people in, in another organization in, in, in recruiting and in talent acquisition and in, in professional development, right? All these individuals who, who don't report into you in marketing, they, they need to help you to implement it to so that it actually gets to the front line. And 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 so a huge amount of collaboration is required in, in order to achieve that. I think one of the really interesting takeaways from, from what you've said is this idea that a lot of times on the consulting advisory side, they see we see too much of our work being purely defined by the deliverable. It's the PowerPoint presentation. It's the visual identity, whereas there needs to be more of a shift to be thinking about, no, no, the deliverable is advisory well what does that mean so advisory means actually understanding these dynamics helping with these dynamics and judging the performance so much actually on the success of those aspects other yeah. than just thinking about great did i deliver on the thing that was in the scope of work yeah absolutely what 100 i couldn't agree with you more because you have to remember that the person who hired you they're only measured on impact right they're 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 hired their whole purpose is to make things happen right um if if as the cmo of alpha sites you know we uh, with my designers we design a great visual identity but it doesn't make it through to the piece of recruitment collateral of the website then then i failed and my team failed right so so all it's all in the implementation and it's all in the impact so to your point advisors need to help you get to that end goal just just handing off a beautiful presentation that's the start of the journey not the end Yet, if you go and look at any case study from any 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 of the any of the brand consultancies, it'll be well. This is the start, and this was this is the end. There's very little that you see in those stories about. Well, okay, the work is beautiful, and I love it, but did any state cut like what, yeah. what actually what actually happened? But how does that connect and translate into impact? Gabriel, let's let's shift just to the final part of the of, of the conversation, just about some of just just to talk about you and some of your sort of individual perspectives and on 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 on, on some aspects. When you think so, so firstly, okay, let me go back. Let me cut that piece and start again. So, Gabriel, let, let's go to the sort of final part of our of so so the last question, sort of on on on, on this transition. You were talking about you were talking about your your mandate where you got internal comms and and, and talent marketing. Um, does that mandate change over time? Like, do you have your eyes on the next thing as well as part of this as 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 part of the evolution of of, of your role and the maturity of of marketing and and how brand is perceived? In inside alpha sites, 
Yeah, so I, that's a really good question. And one of the things that I've been focusing a lot on over the last sort of 12 to 18 months is the collaboration between um, marketing and the product team. I, again, within the context of alpha sites and the fact that we are a tech enabled company and, and our goal is to get our users on, onto this digital platform, it's incredibly important for, for our two teams to work more and more together. And so what that translates into is, for example, on the email marketing side, um, the beginning of my journey was, okay, let's set in place rigor and structure and metrics. Okay, now let's bring in a CRM and a marketing automation tool. Okay, now let's build workflows into that sort of very typical process. And, and, and now after having run through that playbook, um, the next step is, okay, now how do we get more and more of our users to go from a click on an email to I go to our platform, right? And then we continue to engage with them on the platform as opposed to in their inbox, right? So that and that that's just one example, but other examples are user journeys where people go from our website to our platform environment as well. So I think one of the things that's changed for me as a as a marketer is you're really pushing in that direction of how can I collaborate better with the product and engineering team? How can we think about, you know, the the end goal of user engagement being on the platform and, and marketing changing strategies and messages in order to do that? And and also, you know, it has a huge impact on on our Martech stack as well and and um how we think about using it in the future and what additional functionalities we then ask our tech team to build into our in-house tech stack. So I'd say that's probably been the biggest shift in 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 my in my mandate and and, and my focus. And how do you get feedback in turn? Like how do you know how well you and the and the, and the team is performing on on delivering you on delivering the objectives? Like I was talking to the CMO who she when she came in, she actually implemented an internal NPS score, which was interesting. Like I'd never heard that before around around with the marketing team, with other with other business leaders, we could probably do a whole another session just on that on the pros and cons of that. But I'm curious, to like, how do you how, how do you know sort of how your uh, how your how you're being perceived and and how you're doing as a team? Yeah, the the, the um, I, I love the idea of the MPS score. It didn't do that, but the so so half of my team is very focused on client marketing, and and that is eminently trackable. And we can link it back to certain client activities and revenue generation. So, so quite honestly, the numbers tell us if we're performing well. And when the numbers are are good, then the sales team love us. And when the numbers aren't good, they like us a little less, right? So, so that part is is a little bit more black and white, easier to get a temperature check. The the other half of the team, which is focused on topics that are a little bit squishier, uh, you know talent marketing, internal comms, external comms, design, et cetera, there it, it, it is harder to get um, a real-time pulse of, of how, how our work is, is going down. For every person on the marketing team, we run sort of um, evaluations every six months where we ask stakeholders for feedback. That is generally very helpful because number one, it creates a, a feedback culture where you're signaling to the business, you know, we we want you to tell us how, how we're doing. So it kind of, you know, creates that habit. And then very often, even though you're asking for feedback on an individual, what you'll get back is sometimes feedback on the department, right? Or, or on me. And, and so the, that's sort of how, that's another way that I've been getting it. And, and that way you can get it from lots of different levels, lots of different geographies. Right. And then of course, you know, just sort of uh, one-on-ones and catch-ups with, um, you know, people that are kind of in, roughly in my peer group or perhaps, you know, um, one level down that, you know, and, and, and just asking them, you know, how, how they're, how they're viewing the work and, um, what they would do differently and, you know, how they, um, what they thought of how they were asked to collaborate, you know, that, that sort of thing. I, at, at least at Alpha Sites, people when asked are very willing to, to provide feedback. So, it's it's just about asking for it um, all the time, really. How do you ensure you have that on the right cadence with the number of people? Do you have a do you keep it on a spreadsheet? Do you have a is it set times like monthly or three month on the calendar with 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 different people? 
Yeah, so it's 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 basically um, every six months um, after joining, right? So they join, and then after six months, they're sort of. Um, and we decided on six months because that way, you know, you have probation or integration, and then and then you kind of move into a natural cycle. And and essentially, everybody's manager is responsible for running those those surveys. So um, therefore, I then don't have to. Uh, be in total control of it all, right? Um, I just set that cadence and then um, everybody does it for their direct reports. Right. All right. So let's end with a, just a, a, a quick fire round. As you think about your role, as you think about just marketing today, right? Being in a CMO, what, what, what gets you, what gets you most excited? I, I, I love working with people that are super passionate about what they do and who enjoy like the process of doing the work a lot. Um, and and that's what gets them fired up. That I think that's that's what gets me most excited. And what about frustrated? I get very frustrated when the the vision or the brief is unclear. Yeah. That, I think we need to do a whole awesome. episode on 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 better briefs. Yeah, there's a there's a brilliant study that was done that that Mark Ritson, who's a who's an author of uh, and who who's a professor and and writes a column for for Marketing Week in mm-hmm. the UK uh, has been touting a lot this survey that was done with agencies and marketing leads around the quality of briefs and how uh, well, that's his biggest bugbear uh, right now. I, I I totally understand. I I, I just think that um, and I, I get it. It's very hard to know what you want. It's inc- it's it's incredibly difficult, right? Um, but I think that a lot of marketing teams struggle because someone goes to them and says, you know, I, I want a, and so you start to develop a, and, and then you come back with a, and they're like, no, 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 I don't want that. Right. And, and, and so you end up in these iterative processes, which waste a lot of time. They waste a lot of money. Um, and then also they can be incredibly frustrating for all the stakeholders involved. Right. And, and create, um, almost like a, a vibe where people think they're not collaborating properly, where people think they're not doing their jobs properly, right? So, and I think it all comes down from the fact that uh, a lot of individuals um, haven't thought enough about what they're asking for at the beginning. And they haven't understood that, you know, it, it's okay to spend two weeks if that's what it takes, you know, co-creating a really good brief. And and um and that that will will save a lot of time um further down the road so yeah that's definitely um one of my <laughs> one of my pe- bugbears as, as well when you think about your team when you think about talent and this is like advice for sort of younger people as well you, you what's your view on uh generalists versus specialists within within the marketing function overall I think it's really important to become a well-rounded marketer be- before you you specialize. Um, I, I would I would encourage any young person who's interested in marketing to you know, try to collect a variety of different experiences um, in the first uh, sort of eight to ten years of their career. I just think it gives you a lot more um, insight. It gives you more longevity in your career as well. Um, you know, there there there's some people on my team who, you know, when, and I, and I love the confidence when I ask them, you know, what do you, what, what do you want to do later? What's your aspiration? And they're like, I want your job. I want to be a CMO. I'm like, okay, great. Well, then if you want to do that, you're going to have to collect a bunch of experiences, right? You can't just do one thing. Um, you, you need to get well-rounded. You think that's a bit of a challenge today, like with the rise of digital, you start to see there's too many people who then say, oh no, I'm just a digital marketer. And I do do this. And uh, even this idea of no, there isn't a digital marketer. It's just a, it's just marketing because you're a marketer and you need to understand digital. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. You're a marketer and you just need to understand digital, and you're a marketer and you just need to understand design, and you need right. to understand brand. And it, it it's the exact same logic, right? And and there are certain and there will probably be limitations to how deep you can go in your knowledge in any of these disciplines, right? You know, I've I've worked with graphic designers my entire career. Um, I still can't design anything by myself, right? I, I don't know how to use InDesign, but but I know I, I know how to work with designers well. I have an eye for design, right? Um, and I think if people look at marketing with that lens of, you know, I um I need to 
they you need to learn about all of those areas. And, and yes, of course, it's incredibly useful if you pick one or two and you go super deep and you become a deep expert, but it's not realistic to become a deep expert in, in all of them. How do you stay fresh and current? So I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I read books, magazines. Um, I talk to um, a lot of friends and, and colleagues and, and things like that. So that's sort of how I, I, I stay fresh and current. I also, I think one of my favorite ways is, is just to um, actually talk to people who are non-marketers about things that I see. So, you know, asking friends, you know, asking friends who are bankers and asking my kids about what they thought of Mattel's marketing of the Barbie movie, mm. right? It's it that that's I think my favorite way to stay fresh and current because then um you're you're just getting sort of a more unfiltered perspective that uh I, I find helps me think versus reading, you know, 20 articles in, in industry rags that are probably all going to say roughly the same thing anyways. You mentioned books and podcasts, and I was going to ask you maybe for a recommendation of a, of a book or podcast that, that, that you've listened to or, and read in the last, that you've really enjoyed. Yeah. So, um, so I read, uh, I've been reading the book, uh, by the, um, about uh, the Nike, the founding of Nike. Sorry, I need to look it up. Um, That's okay. I can never remember names of books, even yeah. ones I might be reading right now. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I haven't, I haven't finished it, and um, I'm I, I actually, I say reading it. I've been um, listening to it. I do the audio books thing. Books. Um, hold on, hold on. It's gonna bug me. Shoe dog. Shoe dog. Shoe Dog. I highly recommend Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. It's about it's about Nike. Um, yeah, that that's absolutely uh, fantastic. And then, in terms of podcasts, I listen to ones that are not necessarily about marketing, like um, Diary of a CEO or um, Pivot, or you know, just they're not necessarily about marketing. Um, so, so sometimes you'll have an episode uh, related to the topic, um, but. Uh, yeah, so just uh, I, I generally like everyone. I just I like to listen to to podcasts where I think the you know the hosts do a good job. All right, so I, I got the big final question then is what did you think of the Barbie movie? So I thought it was I thought it was very good. I really enjoyed it. I went to see it with my two kids. So I have an eleven year old daughter and a thirteen year old boy, and my favorite part of the experience was that. Um, in one part in the movie, America Ferreira gives this long monologue about how difficult it is to be a, a girl or a woman. And um, after watching the movie, I asked my kids about it. And my 13-year-old boy, who, granted, li lives in London, you know, he has a very sheltered life, right? He said, you know what? It's just as difficult to be a boy, right? I, I don't understand why she's going on about how hard it is to be a girl because all the things she said are true for me as a 13 year old boy as well. And I thought that was really interesting. And, and it gave me a lot of insight into what boys in, in, in his experience, right? So very sheltered London life, the pressures that they're experiencing. And, and it added another dimension for me to, to the movie as well. Um, which was a little bit less gendered and more about um, just a generation and the pressures that a generation are, are feeling. Uh, maybe at the end of the movie, they do end up recognizing it. It's just not as explicit in that, like that beautiful monologue that she had, but in 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 the whole notion of that, you know, he is Kenuff, that that we are all Kenuff. Yeah, no, they they did they did. Uh, you're right. They did they did recognize it. Um, but so so I did I I didn't I did enjoy it. Um, I did like Oppenheimer more though. I still have to see that one. What? Why did you like it more? It's um it's just I mean Christopher Nolan is a wonderful um, director, and it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, his use of sound um, in the movie and and just the cinematography. <laughs> it's it's more artistic. It's more sophisticated visually. Um, it, it's a completely different style. You you really can't compare the the two, uh, but but it's a style that I that I really like. Well, Gabriella, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a a, a really insightful and interesting conversation. The time flew by. Oh, great! Thank you so much for having me. 
That's all for today's episode. We hope these insights from top brand leaders help you as you face your own branding roadblocks. Remember that you're not alone in the challenges you face, and there are always impactful, creative, and human ways to solve brand problems. If you would like to further connect with fellow elite brand leaders and join our community, send an email to gcohen at monogle.com. Thank you for joining us. See you on the next one.